Welcome back everybody to another Motobob video and today you join me out on a little ride on the Husqvarna Svartpilen 401. This is a great looking little bike, plenty of updates for 2024, but are they enough to make this the middleweight rugged looking bike to buy for this particular year? Well in this video I'll give you all of the details with all the pros and cons and then at the end give you my verdict. Now let's start by talking about the engine. It's the single cylinder liquid cooled 399cc I think. Oh it's somewhere near 400 anyway. As you'd expect from this category of bike you get around the 40 odd horsepower mark and I think it's around 40 newton meters of peak torque as well and it's really quite fun actually. I think that's the big thing that surprised me. You look at a bike of this sort of capacity and power level and perhaps think it's going to be a little underwhelming but bang it down into second get the revs up and there's actually quite a lot of fun to be had there and it really does lurch forward in a much more aggressive way than i think i was expecting now there are a couple other nice things about it you've got a couple of riding modes so street and rain you get a quick shifter as standard and it's a nice light gearbox and so all round it's pretty entertaining and uh, yeah, quite revvy, I suppose. Certainly when you compare it to some of the other single cylinder 400 is bikes that I've ridden recently. I wouldn't say it's perfect though. I mean, being a single, you know, it's not super smooth and refined and uh, there are plenty of vibes in the lower revs. I think it smooths out a little bit as you get up to motorway speeds. Uh, I find it quite tolerable at sort of 60 and 70. Uh, it's not terrible down low either. It's just part of it being a single. But I think it's certainly something to be aware of. And if you have a little bit of extra cash, you could look at something like the CL500, for example, from Honda, which just feels that bit smoother. Or even the Triumph 400, which being a single, you know, it's somewhat similar. Also built by Bajaj out in India. Uh, but it just feels like they got the balancing a little better in the lower revs and so uh, it's kind of the opposite of this engine actually i think the triumphs are touched smoother in the low revs and then perhaps the vibes are a little more irritating at 60 and 70 so it's kind of flipped the other thing is maybe the sound is not particularly hair raising let's say and although you might expect that from the standard exhaust uh, this one has been fitted with a couple of accessories. I've had it for a few months from Husqvarna and they kindly put on the headlight guard, uh, the extra radiator shrouds, but most expensive of the bunch is the Rima silencer. And they did say it's not gonna make a huge deal of difference in terms of the sound. But as you can hear, uh, yeah, it's not doing a great deal. You know, it's just got a bit of a thin acoustic to it and some of the other bikes in this segment are richer, a bit meatier, a bit bassier, and maybe there are other aftermarket exhausts uh, from third parties that'll do a better job. But yeah, it's not exactly a bike that's gonna have you, you know, getting all excited when you get on the gas. Like I say, there is a really nice engine. I like the liveliness at the top, the way it revs up to kind of like eight, nine, 10,000 RPM. And you've got that directness with the throttle that you'd expect from a bike that's built upon a KTM platform. They're always quite eager. And uh, this one's very much the same. But yeah, the last thing to point out with it is just that I don't know if that top endiness for a single is at the sacrifice of a little bit of guts down low because it does feel weirdly easy to stall uh, right down in the low revs and I'm talking about when you roll up to like a junction or a traffic light or something like that Even if you've got the clutch pulled in sometimes it just yeah loses momentum and stops And then you have to hit the starter quickly to get back underway now the first couple of times it did it I was like That's a little bit unusual and I wondered if there was some specific issue with my bike But a couple of weeks back I was also reading the MCN review and I think they found the exact same thing, that it just sometimes drops as you roll up to a stop. They said the same with the clutch in. And so maybe it's just a fundamental characteristic of this particular engine. And so, yeah, I'm not sure if it's a deal breaker or not. I mean, it's not necessarily ideal, is it? And of course, when you're at a junction, you want to make sure you're nice and agile to get away quickly. So having to hit the starter, even if it's only half a second, is not what you want. 
Uh, but perhaps there's something that goes away as the engine frees up and runs in a bit. Because this bike's got still, I think, less than 500 miles on the clock. So, uh, yeah, maybe that will ease up as it runs in. But definitely something to be aware of if you're thinking about buying one. Now, onto the chassis. And look, first thing to say about this is that while it does look quite rugged and off-road biased, it's got all the hardware and protectors and bits and bobs like that, the wide bars, the little fly screen at the front, and chiefly those um, Pirelli, Scorpion Rally STR tires that do look quite aggressive. It's got all that stuff, so it might fool you into thinking that it's an off-road biased bike, but it really isn't. I mean, it's pretty much built upon the KTM 390 Duke with a few adaptations, and so it's low slung, it's vulnerable to rocks underneath like most road bikes are. It's got a 17 inch wheel as well, despite the fact that they're spoked, so they look the biz. Uh, you know, it really doesn't have any of the hallmarks of like a proper off-road biased mini adventure bike. They market it a little bit, I think, with like flat track footage. I think they did the launch for the previous gen with a bit of flat track riding as well, but that's probably the full extent of it. I think if you saw a fairly easy going flat gravel road, uh, you probably have quite a good time actually on this bike, uh, but with anything where you're going to get undulations and rocks and stuff like that, you know, this is not the bike for the job. And also, you know, it's really not built ergonomically to be stood up either. Now, the flip side of that is that it's really good on the road. And so maybe you could turn that into a positive in that it's got the image of a bit of a scrambler bike, but they've recognized that most people don't realistically take their bikes extensively off road like that, or this genre anyway. And so they've actually specced it up properly to just be a good road bike, just packing a bit of that image. It's got excellent suspension courtesy of WP, which is the in-house brand at KTM and Husqvarna. And so the ride quality is really good, especially considering the price point. There must be some efficiencies of owning your own suspension company there because, uh, yeah, it feels like a cut above what you'll find on other bikes at this price point. And also you've got full adjustability, which you don't often see either at this sort of £5,000, £6,000 kind of level. A brilliant thing about this bike, definitely that suspension. And also braking's good as well. You've got the single four-pot radially mounted Bybrae caliper. I think they changed sides for this year, so it looks better when it's on the side stand, which I actually think is a great move. Um, but technically, you know, good quality stuff from Bybra. You see it on a lot of these bikes built in India at the moment by Bajaj. The Triumph 400s, for example, I think you see them on some of the Enfields as well. And yeah, there's plenty of stopping power and also adjustable levers so you can get the feel of the levers to your taste. It's nice and light as well. I think it's 159 kilograms without fuel. So somewhere between 170, 180 fueled up. They've added four liters to the tank as well for this year. So a bit more range, a bit more capacity. And yeah, the lightness, the good brakes, the good suspension, the fact that it is sensibly low slung for road riding means that it's a great ride, honestly. It's fantastic, really agile. feel like you can chuck it around and you can make the most of that engine and keep the momentum up. And really the only thing that's maybe ever so slightly holding it back is the fact that it does have those tires. I mean, they're perfectly good and they're a great shout for an adventure bike. You see them on a lot of middleweight adventure bikes, for example, where you might want to do, you know, a decent bit of like dry off-roading. They're not mud pluggers, um, but they'll be okay on drier trails. They're okay on the road as well, but I think it's just the fact that the rest of the chassis is built not at all for off-roading, and yet the tires are definitely more towards that side of things. And so I think, yeah, I'd be looking for something a little more grippy to make more of the bike, or it might be a reason as well to go for the Vip Pillum, which I've also ridden recently, and it just handles a bit better. You've got cast aluminium wheels, so they're a little lighter probably. It feels that bit more nimble. It's a lighter bike, slightly lower bars to get you into a sportier position and proper road focused tires and it's also worth pointing out these are uh they take an inner tube so if you're not comfortable changing tubes to fix a puncture then again you know you might want to look at the vit pillum with the cast wheels which you can just plug with a bung and i think more people are more comfortable with that ergonomically like i say it's quite spacious this bike because of that scrambler inspiration with the wide bars uh, the foot peg position though, again, it feels inherited from a 390 Duke rather than something like a 390 Adventure because it is fairly sporty. 
And then the seat is sort of somewhere in the middle. I mean, they've dropped it from 835 mil from the previous gen down to 820 to make it a little more manageable for a broader range of riders, which I think is the right move, especially at this sort of capacity where you're perhaps tempting some newer riders in. But still, 820 is not so low that it feels like a teeny weeny bike. Uh, the good thing again about the Scrambler styling is you have this very long and flat saddle which gives you a lot of space for moving around and so I really like that about it. And also I think they've done a great job in a time where motorcycle tail sections are becoming shorter and shorter. They've done a really good job of making sure there's a decent provision for a passenger. So it's a good size perch, a nice big grab rail as well which I think is slightly a styling point. It's sort of a bit spoiler looking, but um, you know, practically it's a good shout as well. And then also, you know, decent peg position and all round, I think probably not a bad spot to be on the back of, especially considering that that's typically compromised on A, modern bikes and B, smaller capacity machines. One of the big strengths of this bike though has to be the tech. I mean, this full color TFT display with that Husqvarna design style, the menus are really nice to look at and go through. The settings are really easy to get to and understand with the graphics. And if you compare it to, firstly, the previous gen, which had a very simple LCD display, uh, then it's a big step up. Uh, but also stuff like the Triumph Speed 400 or Scrambler 400 that I mentioned, they've got a much simpler analog rev counter with, I think, an LCD speedo set into that. And while I think the Scrambler has switchable ABS, really there's not a great deal in terms of other electronics. Whereas here, you've got the two riding modes I spoke about. You've got lean sensitive traction control. You've got ABS where you can switch it into super moto mode. So you can lock up the back wheel, slide it around to have a bit of fun that way connectivity features which is quite impressive for a bike at this price and even a few you know little unusual bits like the speed limiter um, which is obviously not quite as good as having full cruise control but it's got to be said it's better than nothing especially if you're somebody who struggles a bit maybe with those average speed limits and you want something to help keep you in check then you might appreciate it backlit switch gear as well led lighting all around a couple of different layouts as well through the dash here and so it really does feel like a massive jump up from the previous gen and you feel like you're getting a lot of interesting stuff to play with for your money and some valuable little safety features as well and us you know like i say earlier this is a bike that's probably going to tempt a few newer riders and so while rain mode and lean sensitive tc might not sound like an absolute necessity for a more experienced rider if you are newer and especially if you want to use it for commuting which you know in town like this it's really really good but if you might be out on a wet day and a bit less experienced then some of those things can be a real you know peace of mind and occasionally a real not lifesaver perhaps but spill saver and wallet saver looks wise has to be said handsome machine it's a slightly you know unique it's an original design language has farners because it takes some traditional ideas and shapes and round headlights and things like that and uh the seat flowing into the tank seems to be a bit dirt bike inspired the tank rack thing is sort of continued from the previous Gen 401. You've got these very chiseled shoulders on the tank. Again, another feature that you'll see on the uh, Svartpillen and Vitpillen lineup extensively, uh, be that the 401s, the 701s that are now discontinued, or even the new 801 Svartpillen. So like I say, it's just a, a sort of jumble of features, visual features and ideas that is realistically not going to be much like anything else you'll see on the market. Uh, but it's instantly recognizable as a Husqvarna and I think it, it works nicely all together. Maybe not everybody's cup of tea. Some people might just be like, I'd rather have the KTM 390 Duke that looks fully modern, more aggressive, more sporty looking. And equally, there's probably people who see the Scrambler 400 or Speed 400 from Triumph and think they look a bit more cohesive and timeless and classic. But if this does sort of take your fancy, uh, looks wise there's not much else apart from the vip pill of course that's gonna potentially appeal in the same way price wise i think this one comes in at 5599 and it's surprising actually given that you get a bit of extra hardware and stuff that that's 100 quid less than the 390 duke with which it shares a lot of components and design features and a bit of the tech and stuff like that 
Normally, I think it's fair to say, you know, if you look at the 790 Duke, for example, and the Svart Pillen 801, uh, you're expecting to pay a little bit more for the swish styling of a Husqvarna versus the KTM. But for this one, for some reason, that's not the case. And as for where that fits into the market, well, it's, I think, a little more than a Speed 400 and a little less than a Scrambler 400X. So that's kind of interesting because you could argue it's a little bit of both. It's got some of the off-road inspired styling of the Scrambler, but realistically, aside from the tires, probably the riding position and uh, the way it handles are actually more similar to the Speed 400. But yeah, it's somewhere in the middle of those two. And you could argue for the right customer as well, it's the best of both. A bit of the looks of the Scrambler, but actually the good road handling of the um, speed. And then you might also want to consider, you know, like I say, if you've got a bit more, just over six grand would get you the Honda CL500 Scrambler, and which is, a, you know, also a little bit modern and retro inspired at the same time, but it's nowhere near as natural, I think, that combo uh, to Honda's design that it is to Husqvarna. This is the one that looks infinitely better out of those two bikes, uh, but it does get you a twin cylinder. Either way, you know, the amount of tech you get in, the way this bike feels in the cockpit, it's just leagues above that Honda and the Triumphs, which have obviously been made a little basic in that regard in order to hit an aggressive price point or at least a reasonable price point. And so riding this bike with that great suspension, you know, Pirelli tires, good braking, great tech, a quick shifter as standard, a speed limiter, the amount of effort that's gone into the design, it all just goes together very nicely and makes you feel like you're getting, I think, quite a lot of bike for your money and something that has, to me anyway, the sort of vibe about it where you feel like excited to crack the garage open and commute to work on it and you probably feel pretty smug about rolling up outside the front of work on it as well as always though i'd love to know what you think of it so do let me know down in the comments below um, which of those bikes that i've mentioned in this video would be your pick i'll also put my review on the screen right now of the 801 version of the spark pill in which i rode a few weeks back and I was very impressed. So if you're more of a speed demon, then the 105 horsepower of that bike, as opposed to the 40 odd of this bike, is probably gonna sound a lot more appealing. Do hit subscribe as well if you wanna see more of the latest motorcycle reviews like this right here on YouTube. A massive thanks for watching today. And I'll see you in the next video.